Right, I'd like to welcome everyone to this next meeting of Marxism. We're very pleased to have John Bellamy Foster speaking at Marxism, one of the leading Marxist theoreticians about the need to defend our planet and our climate. And uh, we're very excited to hear. I hope you give him a warm welcome straight away. My name's Jeannie Robinson, I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party in Chesterfield, where we're proud to... Sorry. I'm Jeannie Robinson, I'm chairing the meeting, I'm from Chesterfield SWP, where we have a very good grassroots campaign to stop, stop INEOS fracking in the old coalfield areas of North Derbyshire, uh, which we hope will be a successful campaign, which we have based very much on Keep It In The Ground. Uh, but our meeting today is entitled Marxian Theory and Eco-Revolution. If you don't know John, then he's the author uh, of many books that I'll talk about later, and our editor of the Monthly Review. He's the professor of sociology from the University of Oregon, and I don't think he needs any further introduction. He'll speak for 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open up the meeting for questions and contributions. Thank you. My talk is uh, entitled uh, Marxian Theory and Eco-Revolution. I want to say only a few words about the environmental crisis itself because I realize uh, I'm speaking to a very special audience here. Uh, I want to talk about how we can use Marxian theory to deal with the problem that we all know about. But, but let me say a few words about the seriousness of the climate crisis, and not just the climate crisis, but the, what we call the planetary emergency itself. If you, um, if you look at the, uh, the IPCC reports, the, the models that the IPCC has developed in, um, prior to the, the, the Paris meetings, they had 101 models that they set up, and they have to they have to fulfill the stipulations of the IPCC, which means that there has to, has to be zero carbon emissions by 2050. We have to avoid uh, we have to avoid breaking the carbon budget. At the current rate, we will break the carbon budget. Uh, we will hit the trillionth ton of carbon emissions in less than 20 years. And that's an underestimate because uh, the, uh, as it keeps on speeding up. And so we, we have less than a generation before we break the carbon budget. And the uh, models are supposed to keep us from breaking the carbon budget. They're, try, they're, they're supposed to uh, get us to zero net emissions by 2050. And uh, all but six of the 101 models that the IPCC set up uh, now uh, instituted, instituted geoengineering into the models in the form of, of, uh, of BECCS, bioenergy and carbon capture, and, with carbon capture and storage. And so uh, we're talking about uh, all but six of the 101 models are planning to have negative emissions to suck uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, even though we don't have the technology yet. The other six models broke the carbon budget. And uh, so this is the, the uh, mentality we have here is it, at the, this point in time that even the scientific models, even the scientists are saying that we are going to break this carbon budget. We are not going to make it except with uh, geoengineering. And it shows a lack of imagination. It shows uh, a refusal to uh, uh, carry out, uh, so, you know, to even contemplate uh, the necessity of changing our society to get out of uh, this crisis. Let me just give you another, a uh, few other pieces of information on this. And it's, this is designed to give you a sense of just how bad the problem is. 
the, the median estimates on what they uh, need to spend in order to set up the bio uh, of the BECCS -E um, uh, in, in order to set it up and, and the median level in the, in the models requires that we spend $500 trillion uh, to, uh, to do that. $500 trillion, and, uh, which will mainly be paid by millennials. And, uh, and uh, they say in the models, the, the, the emphasis is now on trying to suck out the whole trillion tons out of the atmosphere. And uh, the, the models now say that we need, we need for the, for the um, biomass that will be burned to, uh, to uh, power electric plants, and, and then that will become negative emissions because they will, they will capture and sequester it. And supposedly plants, you know, uh, our, our uh, biomass is, is carbon neutral because uh, uh, it, it goes, um, uh, plants take up carbon and release it. It's, supposed to, it's uh, seen as theoretically carbon neutral. And then they say if we sequester it, it will have the effect of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. And, but the, in order to, to do what they're, they're proposing, and this is in the scientific models, and I believe in the science in, in, in many, many respects, but, but uh, the solutions have something to be desired. They're saying that we need, we need a land mass uh, for, for the biomass equal, not equal not to India, but equal to two Indias. And in order to do it, the models say um, that we, we need as much water as is currently used by all of world agriculture. And so they're talking about putting into place these geoengineering schemes that are, are crazy, literally, and irrational, because they actually would, uh, the agroecology and, um, and um, I mean, basically these are going to be, in the models, these are going to be agribusiness monocultural plantations, which actually are less efficient at absorbing uh, carbon than uh, is, um, you know, than our forests, uh, ecosystems, agroecology, et cetera. So they're, the, the, it's irrational from that standpoint too. Well, I could go on and on. There are all, a lot of um, issues, but I want you to understand uh, it would be, um, they, they would need uh, a biomass equal to two Indias or one Australia, um, and, uh, and uh, they would need uh, water, and we're already running out of fresh water uh, equivalent to all of world agriculture. It would cost $500 trillion, and that's probably an underestimate so, um, and what, uh, why, why, why is this being proposed? It's so we can keep on burning fossil fuels. It's because it's assumed we're not going to do anything about it and uh, that uh, we have to create this whole other layer on top of uh, our present energy infrastructure to, uh, to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. There are other uh, proposals too within geoengineering as you know, but I wanted to give a sense of, of how serious a problem this is and you can see the seriousness in terms of the solutions. And uh, what they're not talking about is social change. They're not talking about how we could actually more rationally organize our society and our relation to nature to deal with these problems. So, okay, um, the problem is, um, th there's a very serious problem, uh, which we could call, uh, for short, reification. In our society, you know, you all, most of you know what reification means. It means taking uh, social relations, and, and maybe, and natural relations, relations of people to, to other people, um, social relations, relations of people to nature, and reifying them and turning them into relations between things. And so in our society, we tend, things are so reified 
that the, the people, population can't see the seriousness of the problem. And this is very systematic in our ideology. It's very sy systematic in our commodity fetishism. People actually believe that the, the world runs on money and, and uh, trees have nothing to do with it. Uh, the atmosphere has nothing to do with it. We've reified ourselves, we've reified nature, we've reified our social relations, and we just see these things. We see the market, and the market is, is all controlling. We see technology, and I think we're at a point where people believe in technology more than they ever have in, in uh, history, it, it seems to me. It seems like there's an obsession with technology. Maybe it's because everybody or at least in the rich countries, has a cell phone in their, their uh, pocket. So they feel like, oh, I've got some technology. And so suddenly technology can solve the problems of physics, uh, the universe, everything, because we have these um, magic devices in our pockets. But it isn't as simple as that. Um, so um, we reify. And the, uh, the capitalism is all about getting us to reify our social relations and, uh, and, and actually our relations to nature through production to prevent us from addressing reality, addressing material reality. That's part of what I, you know, uh, I, idealism is about, but it's partly what about mechanism is about. It's partly um, about um, the various um, philosophies that we're usually confronted with are, are um, or versions of reification. Now what we have within, but, but there's a big battle going on over the environment. Um, friends of mine are getting arrested in Vancouver, um, British Columbia right now, trying to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline. There are battles going on all over the world. Millions of people are involved in these struggles, and um, tens of millions, there will be hundreds of millions and billions of people involved in these struggles. It's inevitable uh, because this is our, our reality. And so, but, but um, it's hard to um, find clarity. Even, the, even when you look at the ecological movement, the green movement, there are all of these reifications. Uh, for example, Malthusianism, most of you know about that, but there are many other ways in which uh, we are we are, you know, the, even the green movement takes us away from addressing the realities of the social system. But what Marxian theory provides is a conceptual framework that allows us to break through this. And this isn't just abstract theory. It isn't, just, it isn't unimportant. It isn't removed from practice. It's actually how we break through, how we understand things it's our critical apparatus and it's our science. It allows us to penetrate to the issues when, when others don't. It allows us to, to um, propel the movement forward, to radicalize, to, to show why revolution is necessary. It's why eco-socialism is becoming so big around the world because it's based to a large extent on on uh, reconstructions in Marxist theory. And I think we're seeing the biggest reconstruction of Marxist theory globally um, that we've, we've seen, certainly in, in, a, in about a century. <laughs> and uh, a lot of it, um, there are various uh, tendencies, but at the center of it is um, our ecological struggles. And the, what we've done, you know, what, what people, um, who've contributed to this, have done, is to take us back to materialism, to um, the, the foundations of Marxian theory. And lo and behold, materialism isn't just about economics. Um, Marx's materialism wasn't. It's about our relation to, to the earth. It's the, our relationship to nature, which is connected to our relationship to ourselves, our social relations because at the center of it is production. Okay, so I want to talk about five conceptual um, uh, foundations of Marxian theory, just uh, very quickly to show you how this works. One of these is, is uh, uh, the materialist uh, dialectic. I'm sort of cheating here because uh, materialism and dialectic are two different, you might say they're two different categories. But actually, the, 
um, for, for a Marxist theory, you can't really have a consistent, materialism is important, but you can't really have a consistent uh, materialism. You can't have a materialism that uh, is, is uh, what we, critical and scientific and revolutionary unless it's also connected to dialectics. And in a way, um, you could say that, that in, Marxian, in the Marxian approach, it's understood that, that um, materialists need dialectics more than the idealists do. Um, because the idealists can, can depend on God. They can depend on, uh, you know, they, uh, their dualisms, uh, neo-Kantian dualisms. They can depend on, on thought um, in the abstract and the identical subject-object and so on. Uh, but um, but a materialism that's rooted in a materialist conception of nature and, and attaches that to the materialist conception of history has to understand how uh, life, nature, um, the material world generates itself over time, how it's dynamic and, and uh, emergent and hierarchical and so on. What we've seen is a, a, a revival in certain areas of, um, of, of the Marxist materialism, going back to Epicurus, a revival, and this is this ap apparent in, in critical realism too, of the emergentist um, aspect of, of Marxist thought that goes back to the ancient Greeks where you understand that, um, that uh, the world as we see it emerges and has different hierarchical, hierarchical levels with qualitative breaks. And it's dynamic and contingent and uh, embodies, uh, therefore, contradictions. Marx believed that there was an, an imminent uh, dialectic um, in Epicurus, and he used that as a kind of an intuitive, or and more than intuitive, basis for developing his own materialism. But he developed a materialism that's very closely related to evolutionary theory, where, where it's historical, dynamic, I mean, even in its approach to nature, historical dynamic understands the emergence of different levels, uh, emphasizes contingency, contradiction, uh, er interpenetration, unity of opposites, um, uh, mediation within the totality. All of this is necessary in order to understand how the material world um, develops and evolves. And actually, this is, in many ways, has been replicated in, in, in different, um, with different terminology within science. Now, another concept that Marx used in his, uh, in his materialism and his dialectics, um, his dialectical approach, was metabolism. He took the, the, the notion of metabolism that was developed in 19th century uh, cell biology and uh, used by people like uh, like uh, the uh, chemist, uh, great German chemist, uh, Justus von Liebig, and he applied it to the relation to be between nature and society. And when Marx defined the labor process, he said the labor process, and you could say the labor and production process, was the, was the, the metabolic relation or the metabolism between human beings and society. The labor process was defined as a metabolism between, um, Sorry, between human beings and nature. It was defined as, as that met, um, metabolism between human beings and nature. Now, you don't have society over here or human beings over here and nature over there. Human beings exist within society. Um, sub, where, you know, human beings are uh, within society. Um, in, we, we could say they're emergent level. Society is emergent. Human beings are within nature. I, <laughs> I mean, at their emergent level within uh, nature, uh, but uh, we still exist within, within nature, in Marx's view. And our metabolism then um, is, is, is um, a specific social metabolism, he, uh, in his terms, which is production, which allows us to, to uh, develop society, our, our, um, our relations to nature, our own um, survival as human beings. Uh, we have to take in energy, uh, we have to take in food, we, we uh, emit waste, 
This is fundamental to understanding society, to understanding human beings, and so on. So he used the concept of metabolism, and he defined the labor process as, 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 um, and production as a social metabolism within the universal metabolism within, of nature. Um, but under, um, so this is part of Marx's um, uh, dialectics. And out of this, of course, comes his later notion of the metabolic rift, because the metabolism becomes uh, alienated. You know, the, Marx talked about alienated mediations. Uh, the, when we, if we start robbing and destroying nature and, and, and we, we begin to disrupt the basic ecological processes on which we live, uh, Marx analyzed this in terms of, uh, of the soil problem uh, in so uh, the nutrient problem of the soil in, in the 19th century, but it, it, it applies more generally. If we disrupt uh, uh, that metabolism upon which we depend, uh, then we undermine the basis of our own existence. He called this a metabolic rift. Uh, it's about society disrupting metabolism. And uh, he actually, he didn't say metabolic rift, he said irreparable. Um, uh, rift in, in the interdependent uh, process of social metabolism, but it translates into metabolic rift for short. And uh, Marx, uh, the second conceptual framework is, the, is, is alienation itself, and I've already necessarily referred to that. And for Marx, alienation is about an alienated mediation between us and, um, and nature, between us and, and, and other uh, human beings, uh, class relations. Uh, the uh, capitalism comes about through the expropriation first of, of the land from, from uh, the workers, um, from the peasants, and, and uh, you have both the alienation of, of uh, labor and the alienation of nature occurring at the same time. But we normally have forgotten about the alienation of nature because we reified and we think only about the alienation of labor. But for Marx, they, they come together. If we, um, if we um, alienate, um, in order for labor to be alienated, it has to be removed from the means of production. It has to be removed from the land. It has to be removed um, from its relation to the earth. The third um, conceptual foundation we could say is the critique is um, the critique of value form theory, or the whole critique of political economy, the critique of the role of value plays in in the capitalist economy. And of course, I can't explain all of this. It's all integrated with Marx's general critique of political economy. But the important thing to understand is that our relation to the natural world, which isn't anything mysterious, it's, it's, um, it's um, the world of material existence in which we live. Uh, our relation to the natural world under capitalism is mediated by value relations. Uh, and um, it's, um, this is fundamental to Marx's critique. It's fundamental to his, his distinction between use value and, and uh, exchange value because use value is is related to the natural material basis of, of existence. Exchange value is related to uh, commodity fetishism and abstract value, abstract labor, and, and accumulation. And um, so um, you, have, um, uh, you have an ecological critique in the, in the value analysis. And Marx distinguishes between wealth and value. He says wealth is... is um, basically consists of use values. Um, but um, value is, um, is based on abstract labor, and it leaves nature out of account. And this is a fundamental contradiction for, of capitalism for Marx. The fact that the whole value system is based on, on um, the uh, treating nature as a free gift for capital. Treating nature as a free gift isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, communal societies always did. Uh, uh, they, the free appropriation of nature in a broad sense is something that's necessary for human beings. But to treat it as, 
as a free gift to capital is, is, uh, creates a second order mediation, or a distortion of an old together different kind. Then the uh, fourth conceptual framework is, is imperialism. How do we look at imperialism if we add in the ecological element? Well, then we have to look at um, what we sometimes call unequal ecological exchange or, or, um, or ecological imperialism. Marx referred to that uh, in, in um, relation to Ireland, in relation to the, the, um, uh, uh, the bringing of um, guano from Peru to uh, England to fertilize the fields. And as he noted, they had to create a whole new um, worse than slavery labor system um, called Cooleyism in order to do that. Um, that was uh, fundamental. So all of these things um, are, you know, imperialism can also be looked at in ecological terms. And finally, when we, we look at the the last, uh, we look at the last conceptual foundation I want to emphasize, and that's praxis, a revolutionary praxis. We have to have a broader notion of revolutionary praxis now. We can't make it just narrowly economic, as though we're just the other side of the capitalist value uh, system. We have to actually uh, focus on, on uh, ecological, our whole relation to uh, nature uh, through production, we have to focus on, on social reproduction, you know, what we you know, call social reproduction theory. All of these things, we have to broaden the whole analysis. We have to look at the expropriation of the world that underlies um, the capitalist system, and the expropriation of nature is a very big part of that. So we have to have a no, more revolutionary or co-revolutionary view as, as, uh, as um, David Harvey says, where we bring together our movements around uh, some of these issues that uh, we've too long neglected, and yet it's all within the conceptual foundations of our analysis, and we can develop it. And this is what a lot of people within ecological Marxism have been doing. Uh, the, um, but um, there, <laughs> there's this problem is that uh, we always have, whenever, whenever there are our major developments in Marxist theory and there are new movements, there's the eco-socialist movement, which is connecting to, to uh, the feminist movement over social reproduction, connecting with, with uh, new theories of, of, um, of racial capitalism, all focusing on expropriation. There are new uh, strategies of, of change and revolution. There's also, uh, a lot of uh, contradictions. There are other, um, there is within socialism itself, there emerge uh, other uh, views that often re-reify, to, uh, uh, to invent a word, that we, that, um, we end up um, having arguments where um, a lot of the analyses take us back into, um, via Marxism, take us back into the the dominant ideology and, um, and make it difficult for us to deal with these issues. And uh, I wanted to try to give a sense of what the problem is here. One of the problems is it, it goes back to the split within Marxism between uh, what they sometimes called Soviet Marxism, only it was much broader than that, uh, that was associated with the dialect dialectical materialism and Western Marxism. And uh, what was called the philosophical tradition of Western Marxism. And Western Marxism basically defined itself, in fact, this is, this is the principal thesis, is that the dialectics of nature doesn't exist. There is no dialectics of nature. And they adopted a neo-Kantian view, which is, what that means is that it's a dualist view. There's, there's uh, you can't know the the noumena, the thing in itself, you can only know the phenomenon. And the, the, um, they split the world into two parts. One is, is history society, uh, and the Vickian principle says, well, we can be dialectical with an identical subject-object because uh, we created history and society, and so it's all one perfect circle. And in the neo, in, and uh, Western Marxism, which was influenced by neo-Kantianism, that kind of split, split the positivism was given to the scientific world and the, and the 
and uh, the uh, historical social sciences dealt with the subjective and dealt with values and so on. And, and uh, you have a situation where, where uh, Western Marxism decided it wasn't going to have anything to do with science. It rejected the dialectics of nature, but it rejected science and nature altogether almost entirely. When they talked about nature, it was mostly human nature. And they, um, and, uh, you, um, they did it in order to have a perfect cir circle of the identical subject-object. But nature disappeared from Marxist theory theorizing altogether. And um, then you have a problem with the kind of a reified geography that developed with people like Neil Smith um, and Noel Castry and where they, they basically said, um, we produce nature. And they say, well, nature only exists nowadays to the extent that we've produced it. And there's no nature. Uh, we sub um, we've subsumed nature all the way down, he says. There's no nature but um, what, um, what we've produced. And of course, it, you know, that um, we've affected the natural world. Um, but for scientists, for people who kind of know about physics, material world, the idea that we've produced all of it is, is a little absurd. But this became a very prominent view. There's no, no nature other than what we've produced. Um, and we're only beginning to learn about um, uh, the, the microorganisms in our own, the microbiome in our own bodies. Um, and uh, we didn't produce that. Um, we affect it. Uh, the, um, and what about uh, the universe? What about, uh, you know, what about the earth? What about, um, so um, it's, it's an enormously complex system, the earth system, and we didn't produce it all. But this became, the production of nature became a view, and then we didn't have to deal with the problem because it's actually all social. And then, um, and then we, um, um, then postmodernism said, well, nature doesn't exist at all. And then the Latourians came along with their hybridism, and they say, well, everything's an actant, and uh, rocks, and, and flowers, and people, and you know the atmosphere, they're all actants, and they all act, and we all act on each other. And it's all kind of a flat ontology, horizontal, and uh, uh, it all has agency. And, I, I remember uh, C. Wright Mills used to say um, that, um, that um, he criticized abstract empiricists for, and lib he criticized liberal practicality for saying all facts are created equal. And suddenly we have all objects in the world are created equal. This becomes a kind of extreme form of commodity fetishism where we extended it to the entire earth and then and then uh, Latour joined the Breakthrough Institute and joined the eco-modernists. And uh, it's not, uh, it's, not um, um, it's clear what happened. But now you've got these eco-socialists who are writing articles that say, bees produce value. And you try to explain, well, actually, value is a social category. It has a you know, historical development. It's not just a, you know, it, and, uh, but we, they're, they're now, there's now eco-socialists who are arguing bees uh, produce value, energy produces value, that they're attacking the labor theory of value, they're saying it's too narrow, we ought to say everything is value. And, uh, and uh, then there's um, uh, world ecology theory, the most famous uh, thinker within that is Jason Moore, has an expansive of value analysis, so he says that um, that actually um, the labor and production producing surplus value isn't really that important in terms of the growth of the capitalist economy because what's important is appropriation. Uh, it's, it's what we, we take from the earth, what we appropriate, and it's the appropriation of work, he says, is what is, run, is, what is important. And uh, work he di defines in the terms of physics. And, uh, and says, you know, so any move, any, uh, any uh, energy um, in, the, in the planet, anything, you know, from, from a, a tree to anything that moves, anything that uh, uses energy, um, the whole entropic process, uh, all of that is, is work in the sense of physics. And he says it's the appropriation of work 
that is actually what's fundamental in the accumulation of capital and value, and so, and that we have to understand that. So we have to understand how coal, um, he says, you know, um, um, that when we take coal, um, we're appropriate the, appropriating the work that the coal does, and we're even appropriating the work that the sun did in producing the coal in the first place. And so, um, we have these problems with, with um, the, um, well, you know, Marxian theory. We, we need to, to really use our conceptual framework because this is the, the major weapon, but not weapon, it's the, it's the science, it's the critical apparatus, it's what we can use to build movements to break through the reifications of the system to explain why we need ecological revolution, why it's a fundamental metabolism that's um, at issue. And if we get into these, um, th you know, some of these other ideas, we run into trouble. Uh, for example, Jason Moore says, alienation doesn't mean separation. He says it means, um, he says it means, um, above all, a constitutive and unifying relation rather than a force of separation. Well, if we start saying that alienation means unification, we've basically abandoned the central concept of Marxian theory. We've abandoned the contradictions, and we end up kind of glorifying uh, the capitalist world system or capitalist world ecology. So what do we need? I've got a few more minutes, because she said I could go five minutes over, and, and, and I've got four of the five, right? So, <laughs> so I, what we need is, is ecolo ecological revolution, or eco-revolution, I think that comes off the tongue better. And um, I think we have to recognize just how dangerous things are. There's eco-fascism is, is developing. I mean, they sometimes now, the right sometimes calls um, the environmental movement eco-fascist. But literally, we're seeing eco-fascism develop. Um, and um, the, um, I think that there is a strategy to, um, to deal with um, our major planetary problems, and climate change is only one of them. There, we're crossing nine planetary boundaries uh, by um, a more hierarchical system, building walls. Um, uh, the it's it's the plan is to have an Earth yes yeah, a society that's more hierarchical. Uh, in order to deal with the uh, dangers of climate change to protect the rich. We have these um, ecological modernization is being promoted. In the condition of the working class in England, Engels talked about social murder, right? He said it's a system of social murder. Look at what's happening to the people um, in, in Manchester. And, uh, but now we're having an environmental murder. Uh, a new, you know, uh, a, a further development of social murder. Exterminism um, on a world scale is the way we're heading. And uh, there's, no, there's no doubt about it if you look at even what the, what the science is saying. And we have to recognize the power of the qualitative, right? We have to understand that we can uh, change social relations, that we don't need to, to uh, have as much plastic as we do. We don't need to have a lot of the commodities we do, we have. What we need is to build, um, uh, we need to build social relations. Of course, we have to, the, the, the populations of the poorer countries have to develop. But what we need is, is to create quality of life and ecological sustainability and substantive equality. And um, uh, the, uh, this has to take priority over the kind of system that we have. We have to recognize that there's a corporeal rift that's, that's uh, destroying human bodies, that's part of the whole ecological problem, and that takes us right back into the fundamentals of Marxist theory and our past struggles. And we have to realize that um, the, um, we, um, the Earth system is, is um, part of, of our, our reality, and the Anthropocene is permanent. The Anthropocene won't go away uh, because we're now, um, now um, having a geological uh, impact on the planet. That will continue. It's what kind of impact we want, we're going to have, how it grows or doesn't grow, um, 
how rationally we organize society. We need planning, um, and planning is a scary word. I once uh, spoke to this, this at this conference, and, and I mentioned planning, and people looked scared, like socialists were scared of planning. Well, ecologists are talking about planning. We need planning. We don't need ecological modernization, but we, we definitely have to plan production. And that's the most dangerous in, thing in the world from the standpoint of capitalism. And that's what's right, coming down the turnpike because the whole world will uh, go in that direction. The question is, do we move fast enough? And uh, do we wait too long? And what are the costs of waiting? Uh, so um, I, hope, I hope you have got from this a different kind of perspective on on uh, the importance of ecology to Marxism. Thank you. Um, thanks for the great talk and all that you've written uh, over the years and inspired so many of us. Uh, I'm from Canada, and uh, I just was listening you know, to the components of Marxism that are so useful uh, in analyzing what's going on with climate and, and how to fight the, uh, the terrible changes brought about by capitalism and noting the huge overlap between our values as socialists and the values of indigenous peoples. And in Canada, this is a very big deal because it's indigenous peoples who are leading the fight against uh, tar sands expansion. And when he mentioned things like uh, metabolic rift and um, uh, commodification, the role of imperialism, uh, all those things are opposed by indigenous activists. They may or may not use those words, but most of them are opposed to capitalism, explicitly so, and against colonialism. Um, another Canadian comrade and I have drafted a leaflet, or actually a booklet, called Indigenous Sovereignty and Socialism, which we hope to have ready in a couple of, of months. Um, I wanted to pick up specifically, though, on something that, um, uh, that John talked about in terms of uh, Vancouver, and that Standing Rock uh, is known to many of you, and I think that Vancouver is going to be the next Standing Rock. So what that issue is, is a company called Kinder Morgan, a Texas-based pipeline company, mainly run by former Enron executives, uh, wanted to build a twin, a twin pipeline from the Alberta tar sands right through the mountains of British Columbia, ending up on the harbor of, of Vancouver and Burnaby. Uh, they backed out because there have been uh, court cases going forward, a lot of public opposition. And rather than let it die, the Justin Trudeau Liberal government has bailed them out. So Kinder Morgan got into this project for something like 600 million. They've already been bailed out by the, or about to be bailed out by the Liberal government for over 4 million. And then the government is going to take over building this pipeline if there are no third parties that come forward by, I think it's next week. Um, so the opposition continues uh, apace. It's led by First Nations, but also it's a mainstream opposition movement. Even the mayors of Vancouver, the mayor of Burnaby, have said, I'm willing to do dis civil disobedience to oppose this. It's very mainstream, and unlike Standing Rock, that was in a geographically isolated area in the middle of winter blizzards, this is a you know, sort of English uh, temperate climate in a, a multi-million uh, population, and I'm sure people from Seattle, et cetera, will come up for it. Um, but we are gonna need your solidarity when the shit hits the fan. It's solidarity with the indigenous activists and also a clear demand for just transitions for fossil sector workers. Because it's not fair to say, you have to lose your job, I'm gonna keep mine, but you've gotta pay for this, this transition. It's not fair at all. And there's lots of opportunities, lots of alternative jobs. So please watch out for this. We are gonna need solidarity from around the world on this. Right, Carolina will be followed by Ryan Scarrow. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have, oh, thank you. I have uh, started to read uh, The Capital of Marx. And basically, the way I have read the first three chapters is as a story about how we go from the circulation of commodities to the moment that the muddy community appears. And, what I, and please correct me if I'm wrong. What I feel is that what he is telling us is that the the value system that we have in place determines the velocity of the exchange and determines the level of production. And around this, uh, this message that I thought I got from the book, I'm trying to, to think or to rethink 
the pricing system that we have right now under the capitalist system and how we can use the theory of value of labor the theory of labor value of, sorry um, to rethink or to imagine a new th uh, system of value that can help us to limit the levels of production and consumption on under the context that we have now and my belief is that Marx was talking about his his own time of course there are things that are valuable for all the time but what I'm trying to say is that I want to use this framework to think on something that is into our context so if you can give me some ideas or let me know if I'm wrong in the way that I'm reading the first chapters of Capital thank you Ryan will be followed by Camilla Royal Well, actually, I, um, I had a question specifically for, uh, uh, for Dr. Foster, because I'm an editor for a peer-reviewed journal on, on sustainability. And we are getting tons of articles on payment for ecosystem services. So it's directly tying into this, uh, this notion of, oh, well, what if we pay people to, you know, keep, you know, to not, uh, degradate their land? What if we pay people to do? And it ties into this, this notion of natural capital and, and, and you know, these abstract values. And so I wonder, will that keep perpetuating this system you know, and, and keep us from being able to move to the system that we actually need if you know, the more we buy into oh, this idea of natural capital and paying people for this, are we, are we staving the collapse until it does finally completely collapse and we can't stop it. So that's my question. Um, Camilla, followed by Philip Walden. If you could come um, to the front. Yeah, I think um, we could probably um, gather from John's talk that there's a huge amount of uh, debate and controversy among ecological Marxist theorists at the moment. You know, sometimes quite heated debates, people you know, telling each other that they're not proper Marxists and all kinds of things like that. Um, and, you know, we probably have, have some slight differences. I'm maybe more sympathetic to people like Smith and Castry than, than perhaps John is, but I don't really want to talk about that too much. I mean, I agree on the Latorian thing as well, because those, those people, they're not, it's not just that it's in, incompatible with Marxism, they're incompatible with theory, really. They just, they don't want to come ready, you know, ready with a theory and apply it to how we think about the world. They just want to sort of, you know, go out and let the world affect them. And it's, it's not really compatible with how we would think about, about approaching things. But I wanted to come back to, um, you know, why this theory is so important for sort of debates among, among um, ecologists and in, in, in the environmental movement, really, because this kind of theory, as I understand it, came out of a sort of a critique of, um, of deep green kind of thinking. What I mean by that is the kind of the assumption that the environment just exists, or, or that nature, I guess, just exists in a kind of state of harmony, and that it has this in internal kind of coherence to it, and that, and that humans are just a threat to nature, that we just kind of impact upon nature, uh, and that consequently we should reduce our impact by reducing the numbers of us and reducing our population and things like this. These you know, ideas are still around. You know, David Attenborough, who's you know, done a huge amount to inform us about the amount of plastic in the ocean and things, he's also someone that thinks that the human population should, should be lowered and that we should reduce our impact on nature. So I think that the importance of the theory that John and others have developed, the theory of metabolism, is that it's not just um, saying there's a conflict between humans and nature, it's going back to this idea that there's a, an, an interaction, it's a, a complex interaction of co-production um, between humans and nature, which is, and you know, the, the, the capitalism has alienated us um, from, the rest of, from the rest of nature. So I think it's, you know, it's hugely important to, to use that, that kind of critique to have you know, kind of sympathetic debates with, um, with others in the environmental movement that, that take a different view. Um, yeah, so, uh, some of the criticisms against John are that he doesn't, is that he's a dualist and, and his colleagues, and that they don't um, look at the latest science, and I think those, those criticisms are completely unfounded. Uh, Philip, we followed by John Molyneux. 
Uh, yes, thanks for all your work, John. Uh, you've spoken about the metabolic rift and you've spoken illuminatingly about the neo-Kantian absolute division between society and nature, which is obviously a, a wrong absolute division. Um, I want to take up the point you were making about alienation because, uh, as comrades in the room will know, when Marx talked about alienation, he generally, using the German word entfremdung, was talking about the alienation of the worker's product from the worker in the production process. Now, before Marx, there was a chap called Hegel who also talked about alienation, but when he talked about alienation, he generally used a different German word, entäußerung. And what that meant was when you have the principles that you hold as a human being dearly to yourself ripped out of you. And he said that there are aspects of uh, the society that he lived in, although, of course, Hegel didn't recognize it normally as capitalist society, but there are aspects of, your, of the society that we live in which tend to... Um, dull or, or uh, dilute the principles that we hold very strongly for, uh, to, uh, in ourselves. The principles, for example, that we hold strongly as socialists are that other human beings are very important to our individual, to our own individual existence because other human beings are the source of inspiration and the source of our, uh, our social well-being, which ultimately is the source of our individual well-being. So, it's, so Hegel is actually somebody who I think is absent from the discussion largely in, uh, 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 about the importance of the ecology. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to say is that when I'm with Greens who don't agree with socialism and who are always talking to me about the need for a no-growth society or, as, or a negative growth society, I say to them, why can't we have a society in which there is planned socialist growth and they don't understand what it means? John, be followed by Martin Empson. Right, first of all, I just want to say that I think all Marxists um, owe John Bellamy Foster a debt of gratitude. Uh, just speaking personally, uh, in the last 30 years, I didn't read a single book that had such a transforming effect on my understanding of Marx and Marxism as Marx's ecology. It really changed my understanding, and I think that would be true for a lot of us, so big thanks for that. But w what I want to do here is make a, uh, a much more practical uh, contribution, uh, uh, not just about the philosophical stuff, because I think one of the problems in mobilizing people over climate change is it's such a big thing that people think, well, we're going on a mass demonstration against climate change. Well, it's an abstraction. They may be aware of it, but how, what are you actually demanding? What are you actually do doing? And so on. And in this respect, the recent experience in Ireland is quite useful because the movement developed called Leave It in the Ground which was to say stop uh, exploration uh, and granting of licenses to take, remove fossil fuels uh, from uh, the ground or the waters around Ireland. And we were able to use our parliamentary representative people before profit to put a climate emergency bill through the, 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 the parliament, which says precisely that. It says that the Irish government should stop granting licenses to anybody to take uh, to extract any more fossil fuels from Irish land or, or water. And the extraordinary thing was, I mean, to do with the way Irish politics is at the moment, but I won't go into it, the extraordinary thing was this passed its first reading in, in, in the Doyle. Now, I, don't, I think they'll try and sabotage it in committee, but this is great because we can actually mobilize people around this. It's something real and I I I immediate. And I think that's a useful demand. Maybe in other countries, you, we can put that. Leave fossil fuels in the ground. Let's legislate for that. It's a demand that Corbyn and the Labour Party could take up uh, uh, and so on. And that gives you something concrete. The point is not that that solves the problem. Let's be honest. You can't solve the world uh, climate change from Ireland, whatever you do. Of course, we have no illusions about that. But it does enable you to build an actual movement around something real. And insofar as you get business and so on lobbying against it, it shows in practice where uh, uh, capitalists and the ruling class stand on the issue, it exposes them. So I just think that's a useful uh, I initiative to report. Uh, 
um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, or, or, or re-emphasize, I suppose, the importance of Marxism as a set of ideas uh, 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 rooted in a materialist analysis of the world for understanding and, uh, and dealing with the climate catastrophe. You see, I, I'm, I'm struck quite often how inadequate other methods of understanding the world are, how inadequate other philosophies are. I mean, John mentioned in his introduction the French philosopher Bruno Latour. Here's a quote from Bruno. Objects have as much agencies as persons. Do not hammers hit nails? And Bruno then goes on to talk about the way that rivers have agencies because they change their own courses and so on. Now, uh, that, may, that may well be a, a faz fantastic way to write about the world. Actually, as a method of understanding what's happening, it's completely and utterly inadequate. And I think the clarity of Marxism is it, it both can explain why it is a small group of people own and control the means of production and do so through the systematic burning of fossil fuels, how that came about and how we can change it. In a nutshell, that's really what the importance of Marxism is in that context. Within that, of course, there are all sorts of discussions and debate, and John, John talked about them. I mean, the, 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 the current debates on the left, I, I don't say the Marxist left, I think they're debates amongst the widest left about the relationship between society and nature, and sometimes these take, as Camilla suggested, quite abstract discussions. They're really about trying to understand that systematic relationship. Now, Marxists argue that there's a particular point in history, the development of capitalism, which then leads to the development of fossil fuel capitalism that leads to the environmental disaster. It's not simply a a constant in human history, but there is an interesting discussion about that relationship between nature and society. Some people say that there's no nature left at all, that it's all created, produced uh, by, 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 by humans. Some argue that there's a seamless whole, that nature and, uh, and, and human society have become this, this, uh, this merged things. And I think what, what, what Mar the Marxist tradition says is that humans are both part of nature uh, and separate, separate from it. That's the, the core, core dialectical idea. And I think we can, we, you know, John, John has used the analogy in one of his books about, you know, you don't talk about the heart being separated from the body, but the heart is a separate organ to the rest of the, uh, of the body. That's a, a dialectical under, under, uh, understanding of the world. And the other side to this, of course, is that it means we do not, as Marxists, ignore the fact that nature does have its own role, its own autonomous laws, its own things that go on and take place, and we can interact and relate to them, but they still continue to, to go on. And that, I think, is the essence, of course, of the, the metabolic interaction that Marx talks about, the fact that we interact with nature, nature changes us, we change nature, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And Marxism, I suppose, at the end, can explain why it is that we have a particular set of relations, because there's nothing in nature that does to the world what, 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 uh, what capitalism does. There's nothing in nature that accumulates wealth for the sake of accumulation. That's a human invention. That's a creation of human, human, human society. But that's at the heart of all the environmental crises that, uh, that we face. And I think if we want to be clear on what Marxism can offer to people, when we say to people the question of planning a democratic economy, actually, I think the better way to talk about it is to say, let's actually have production for need, not for greed. Let's have production for the people who need it and the planet that they live on, because a need of humans is to live on a sustainable world. That's one of the core aspects of what we, what we need. Let's have a productive system based on that. Marxism allows us both to interpret the world and get to that object, and it offers us real agency in the form of a working class that creates all the wealth in society and can change the world. Right, many apologies to all the people I wasn't able to call. And I'll ask John now to sum up the last 10 minutes. Do I have two minutes? Or? <laughs> well, yeah. well, a wonderful set of uh, comments. And uh, I was very pleased um, to hear about, um, somebody get up and talk about the struggles of indigenous people in, in um, Canada. And of course, all the, the, um, the others that are allied with them. There are real struggles going on in Vancouver right now. I was just up there. And uh, they're being led by, uh, in many ways, by the Vancouver eco-socialists, uh, playing a very big role uh, in, in the, um, the fight against the pipeline there. And um, one of my friends, uh, just uh, got arrested. They fined him uh, $3,000. So we're going to try and raise some money for that. Um, 
But there are, are real struggles going on, and uh, they're, really, they're being led by people who are Marxists, um, and uh, they're um, eco-socialists, and uh, there's no contradiction. And uh, this, especially the battle over Kinder Morgan. The, um, in, in terms of the question of, of Marx's capital, the circulation of commodity, and creating a new uh, concept of value, you know, there's, uh, for Marx, of course, when he talked about value, he was mostly talking about, he was talking about capitalist, the capitalist system of value, value in, in commodity value. The, um, and um, value in, in that sense was very specific to capitalism. It's at the core of the laws of motion of capitalism. But we also use uh, value in a larger sense to, you know, to, to refer to uh, intrinsic value, to in, uh, refer to worth. Um, and uh, we, we probably shouldn't confuse the two. Uh, we get into a big muddle if we, we confuse the two. Um, but um, I think the category that, that uh, we should focus on is, is use value. That sounds like a sort of a dull category compared to, to value with all of its permutations and uh, its exchange, va exchange value forms and, and uh, uh, money and commodities. Use value seems, sort of, seems uh, uh, a very dull category, perhaps, in relation to that. But actually, use value, for Marx, is not, it isn't a subjective category. It's an objective category. It's about uh, the material base of production. It's about uh, the natural material relations, about the material flows that go on within production. It's about actually uh, satisfying uh, human needs. It's about wealth, real wealth. Uh, real wealth for Marx consists of use values. And we have to go back and we have to think in terms of use values instead of in terms of money. People uh, see money as the ultimate mediator, the, the means to uh, get everything. This is, uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, it's, it's real needs, it's, it's genuine use values, it's, it's the qualitative aspect of production, especially that we have to focus on, and we have to focus on the natural material relations. So the concept of use value is really the direction in which we have to go. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, someone was editor of a journal of sus on sustainability, and talking about uh, payment for ecosystem services, and uh, is this a means of perpetuating the, the, the system of natural capitalism? It's a very complicated issue. Uh, you know, it's, it's a complicated issue because we live in a capitalist society, and to some extent, we have to, we have to try to protect um, uh, natural you know, values. We have to, uh, we have to protect uh, old growth. Uh, we have to do all sorts of things, and sometimes, um, sometimes in the process of our struggles, we have to compromise uh, with the system in specific ways. But overall, I think we have to we have to direct ourselves at changing the entire um, system of production that uh, creates this situation. The um, the model for uh, a lot of the uh, eco-socialist analysis now is is um, is uh, ecosystem services. Uh, so they, um, uh, Raj Patel and Jason Moore wrote a book about uh, um, uh, the history of the world in, in terms of uh, seven chiefs. And they talk about these various chiefs, nature, care, work, uh, and uh, energy, raw materials, uh, the and food. And they say the whole, the whole, uh, issue is uh, for capitalism is to keep those cheaps cheap. And uh, this is sort of a, an ecosystem services uh, approach. It's sort of saying, well, we, capitalism depends on these ecosystem services. We have to analyze um, uh, these factors and how the system tries to cheapen them. And uh, I don't think that this is particularly useful. It's not a particularly useful way to understand capitalism. And what we have to do is focus on production, not circulation, not on simply commodities. We have to understand when Marx is talking about 
the metabolism between uh, human beings and nature. When he's talking about the social metabolism, he's saying that's the labor and production process. And where our ecological theory goes is it says we have to revolutionize production. And that isn't a new idea for socialists, but we have to understand it in new ways, in new, more fundamental reasons for, for revolutionizing production. Let's just top, stop talking about market relations and managing ecosystem services and talk about changing uh, production. Incidentally, on natural capitalism, the idea was invented by Paul Hawken, and he wrote an article for Mother Jones, and uh, they did the big feature, Natural Capitalism, and Mother Jones asked me to write a reply to be printed in the magazine, so I wrote a reply, and they said, well, we can't print that, that's too critical of Paul Hawken and uh, natural capitalism. But it was in the early days of the web, and they had set up this kind of um, the, this uh, web program with, with codes, and they gave me the code, you know, where there was going to be a discussion. So I put my, my comments up on the, the, uh, the web, and that got Paul Hawken upset. He said I was dissing him, and uh, he said that over the years, you know, when they came out the book Natural Capitalism. But the basic idea is the way to solve the problem of the environment is internalize the environment within the market. Well, if you understand that capitalism is a system of accumulation, internalizing everything within the environment, within the market, it's not going to solve the problem. It's, it's, just, it's going to just destroy it in a different way. It's not, like, um, it's not like the forests have been saved because they were inserted into the market. Um, that's, not, that's actually been the basis of deforestation. Camilla talks about... Um, the, um, how a lot of this theory arose um, uh, out of um, attempt to uh, critique green theory, that, that Marxian ecology actually is more sophisticated, goes to the rock bottom aspects of the problem, doesn't see things in misanthropic terms, like us against nature, but sees it in terms of us that our relation to nature is through our production in the broadest sense. And that's what we have to deal with. And it's not, it's not people aren't the enemy, and nature isn't something out there. We relate to, to um, we're, we're part of nature, we relate to it through our own metabolism, our own social metabolism, which is production, and that's what we have to address. And any other approach to uh, the ecological problem is simply a reification, just distortion. It, it uh, is, is pretty much useless, unless we understand that the whole thing comes down to our system of production. So, you know, um, I think that was really what Camilla was pointing to, that literally we have to revolutionize production for ecological as well as economic reasons. And you know, um, materialism is broader than just economics. When, Mark, when Engels wrote The Condition of the English Working Class, read it. It's just as much about environmental conditions as it is about uh, the economic conditions of the working class. And when those two things come together, that's when you have the most revolutionary situations. Uh, in terms of the notion that, you know, on the metabolic rift and, um, and um, well, Hegel's word for... Uh, alienation um, and bringing Hegel in uh, into the ecological discussion, I, that, I think that's very important. Uh, the, the concept of alienation is very complex. We have to uh, think about it. I was just looking at Lukacs' The Young Hegel uh, the other day, and in the final chapter of The Young Hegel, Lukacs is actually dealing with Hegel's use of, of alienation, which which is, he translates as externalization, which is very, very useful because you begin to understand um, the capitalist relation to nature in a different way if you start to see how alienation is related to externalization. It gives you a new dialectical uh, approach to this. So I think Hegel is very useful in this sense, and I would recommend that discussion by Lukács. In terms of... of um, of, um, of Ireland, uh, I mean, I, you know, what it makes, I, I guess you all know, and I hope I'm not, uh, for some people, it might be a 
a sore spot, but Ireland was a colony of, uh, of England. Just kidding, you all know that. And, uh, but look, they're, they're taking this radical ecological stance. Why? Um, well, it's a product of Irish history. They had, their, their ecology was destroyed by another country nearby, um, across, uh, across the sea. And um, this is fundamental. And actually, we're finding the most radical ecological struggles are, are in you know, what we call the global south, but in countries that have been colonized and, and where people are dealing with the issue of colonize, uh, colonization and indigenous pe people. But if you want to understand, uh, I think, why um, Ireland is so is taking the position it is and how it relates to Irish history and how it relates to Marx. I would recommend read the uh, work of uh, Eamon Slater, who is um, at, at, at um, was it, Munoth, Munoth University, Maynooth, Maynooth University, who, uh, is, uh, who uh, has been uh, doing a comprehensive ecological analysis of Irish history using Marx's concept of metabolic rift. And, uh, in terms of Martin John, Epson's, we have to state, finish yeah, Martin Epson's uh, 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 what he said was perfect, and maybe he should have given the talk rather than me. It was so succinct. And you're lucky to have him around. And in terms of Tom Kay and the financial appeal, um, it's, it's really, really important uh, to keep this organization going. Yeah, it means a lot to us um, where I live as well, not just in England, but maybe people all over the world. So uh, this, this conference has a history.